you said after the um, last home game that you were pretty confident you were going to lose this game. When was the last time you went into a game thinking you weren't going to win? Or confident About that you ten times win? a year. You know, it depends what kind of team you have. You know, you always have to know. Um, I always, I always think of it in these terms. When you, have a, when you have a certain kind of team, you say to yourself, look, if we play our A game, what's going to happen? We're going to win because the other team can't do anything about it. So you have to be realistic. Those guys tomorrow night feel like playing and they play their A game, we're not going to win, even if we play our A game. So that's real. That's realistic. So the key is, can we play our A game against them? That's all your work. That's all you're looking for tomorrow night. Can we play our A game against them? Beating them is not the issue. You know, beating them is not the issue. You know? Um, I don't know that I've ever had a team here at Connecticut that could successfully play against a national team. And I don't mean a make-up, pretend national team. I mean, like, the real national team. And expect that they're going to go in there and win that game. Unless those guys just don't show up and say, ah, you know what? I don't feel like it tonight. So I got a feeling that ain't going to happen. Anything you miss about coaching the national team? Or... Do I miss about coaching the national team? Yeah, well, that when I call a timeout, should I say, actually gets done. So I miss that part. Uh, I miss their professionalism. That you don't have to follow them around every minute of every day. You don't have to repeat yourself 15 times every minute of every day. You don't hear my bad every other possession. You know, it's just, it's, the pressure's in, in, incredible, but um, they give you a lot to work with. So, uh, coaching the national team was kind of like coaching my best UConn teams. Our job was just, our goal, let's just go play our A game. Let's go play to, to the level of our ability and nobody can touch us. It's only if you let yourself play bad that any team in the world is going to beat us. On our best days, nobody's going to nobody's going to beat us, and that's you still have the pressure. You have to win. You still have to play your best game. And the players would always remind me, it can happen, you know. And I'm thinking, no, it can't. At least I say that. No, it can't. Meanwhile, I'm scared to death that it could happen. But I'm thinking, not if we play our A game, we can't lose. But who's to say you're going to play your A game every single night? And the thing is, you're playing against teams that if you don't bring your A game, and they do, that's the night you're going to lose. So I miss the, I miss the challenge of getting the best players in the world in the right frame of mind and in the right, you know, space to play their A game every single time we were together. I miss that. I miss that, that level of competition. I remember after your, your first Olympic run, you were asked if you'd do it again. You said something like. It's like going back for a second on ice cream. It never tastes as good as the first one. So yeah. Probably not. Obviously, yeah. you did. What do you remember about that process, <clears throat> deciding to do it again? I mean, that's why you should never make decisions immediately after the season, immediately, you know, when you're making emotional decisions. The wear and tear of, of preparing for the Olympics, because it's a four-year process, so started in 2008, and now after four years, you win a gold medal in London and somebody says to you, hey, you want to go through that again? First reaction is no. I never want to go through anything like this ever again because of how difficult it is and how much of a toll it takes. Then after you take some time to digest everything that happened and then they put it to you in a way like you owe it to yourself, you owe it to, you know, why would you not do it? La, 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 la. They, you know, load up on the guilt trip stuff, you know, you have to do it. Um, you always have the right to say no, but I thought to myself, hey, it's not like all these guys I just coached are leaving. They're all coming back. So now we know each other a little bit better. And I think if we go and add the players that I think we're going to add, reason, one of the reasons I did it, so we can go to Rio and we can be the best team ever. And I think we came close to that. I don't know that any Olympic team has ever had as their 10th, 11th, and 12th players three WNBA MVPs. As 10, 11, and 12 on our team. 
What kind of emotions do you think you're going to feel just seeing so many former UConn players on the South Carolina Tomorrow night? Yeah. You know, we've been in that situation before where we've played, you know, our national team and we've played against some of our former players. And I was thinking about it this morning, as a matter of fact, that uh, between them, between that group and the team that, you know, the, the 09 and, and 10 teams, um, if you were to take a snapshot of the players that are going to be there, uh, it kind of tells the story of the last 25 years in, of women's basketball. And I'm going to look out there and I'm going to feel pretty damn proud that we had a lot to do with that. That's pretty incredible. It represents so many great moments. Well, when you look at it, so every year since 1996, there's been a UConn player on the Olympic team. I don't know who else can say that in America. What would you say about what UConn has meant to USA Basketball and what, what USA Basketball has meant to UConn? Yeah, it's been a, it's been it's been a two way street. You know, it hasn't been all one way. Uh, I'm fortunate that uh, I've gotten the chance to recruit kids that, from the time they were 16, you know, start their experience with USA Basketball. And then, because they enjoy the experience and it means so much to them, it becomes a focal point in their life. So they stay with it from age 16 to, well, 38, you know? So that's a long time. And it's because of their commitment to the, to the program. And then what it does is, when those guys go overseas during the summers while they're still at UConn and play, when they come back, they're better players. They're a little bit smarter. They're a little more, you know, world, worldly. Um, so I, I, I think the uh, the relationship has been amazing because we've done a lot to provide them with a lot of great players, and they've done a lot to make our players better. Um, you know, when they come home and when they uh, when they become pros. How do you think the visibility of being the Team USA coach? two Olympic runs helped you recruit some players that, that could have gone anywhere in the country? Um, if at all. I don't know. You know, um, I think uh, I think the, the, the time that I spent coaching them, um, you know, we, we were going to get, the kids that we got, we were going to get those kids anyway. You know, and the kids we didn't get, me being the coach of the Olympic team, didn't matter when I owed them. So I don't know that it, it gave me a, a, a leg up on anybody. Um, you know, I, I think the, the fact that um, I probably had one input on one player in the eight years I was in the national team where I actually put my foot down and I said, this kid will be on the team, on the national team. This pro will be on the team. No way, fans or butts about it. That was the only thing I ever said. The rest of the time it was, hey, here's your team. What do you think of it? I said, damn, I like it. So it wasn't like, you know, they would call me every day. Hey, who do you want on the team? Give me your list of 12 and let's go. So I could go tell recruits, hey, by the way, I get to pick the entire team now. No, never happened. Who was that player? Asia Jones. <laughs> There have been, I think, 11 players, and you can fact check me on this. I think there's 11 players with NCAA, WNBA titles, Olympic, and World Championship, and you have seven of them. Well, I just had this conversation with Crystal Dangerfield. The, the, thing, that, the thing that I think sets you apart from everybody else is when you're in college, and you do the same thing everybody else does, then don't expect to get anything different than what anybody else gets. So you gotta prepare differently, you gotta play differently, you gotta practice differently, you gotta think differently, okay? And because you do that, you learn how to survive in any environment. You learn how to win. You learn how to, you, you learn how to compete. And that doesn't go away, so they come here, they win a championship, 
or two or three or four. And then when they leave, winning becomes not an, I mean, it's not like, well, you know, you win some, you lose some. No. You either win them all or you win most of them. And more importantly, you win championships. So that doesn't, that doesn't go away. And I guarantee you, Sue and D in Tokyo have no less a desire to win their fifth gold medal than they did their first national championship at UConn ever. That that, that mentality, that drive is still, is still that strong. And we try, to, we try to instill that in our players from the day they get here. Not all of them get it, and not all of them have the talent. But if you do have the talent and you do get it, you're not going to stop winning no matter where you go. You're not. We look at all the players on our team that have won WNBA championships and how many WNBA championships our players have won. You know? So, it, once you get used to winning, man, that doesn't go away. As a matter of fact, your, your, your desire to win gets even stronger. No, I'm, 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 I am surprised to the, because of the fact that what you said, Maya is one of the ultimate great competitors. I mean, I've said this publicly, privately, to anybody that'll listen. I've had some great kids come in here, some great players, some great athletes come here. I think anybody in our program will tell you there has never been a kid come to UConn as a freshman and be more physically, from a competitive standpoint, ready to play college basketball than, than Maya Moore. Her competitiveness and her, her drive to win and to be the best, to win at everything, every sprint, every shooting drill, every car game, every, you name it, everything that was being done, she had to win. So for somebody like that, who's won so much, to step away means it had to be something that was so powerful and so personal to her that she would be willing to give up the one thing that I think has defined her life for most of her life. Am I surprised? Yes. I'm, I am surprised. But at the same time, when I found out why, you know, I didn't try to talk her out of it. I just said, you need a platform, Maya. And you're walking away from that platform. And you need money. And you're walking away from a lot of money. And she said, I know that. I know that. And I'm not saying I'm walking away forever, but I got to do this right now. And I said, I admire you for that. Well, what, what about with Stewie? I mean, uh, obviously the, the Achilles is such a, that's such a horrible injury. It's so hard to come back from. Yeah. And I don't know that she can face in terms of injury a lot of adversity in her life. And now, you know, right after being MVP, she lost a season. Yeah. What do you feel like we're going to see from her? You know what's funny? The whole time she was here, the one player she always looked up to was Kevin Durant. So when she finally had a chance to meet him, I remember saying, son of a gun, you know, she's, she's like the Kevin Durant of women's basketball because she's 6'3", 6 6'4". 6 her wingspan makes her about a seven-footer in the NBA, okay? And the kid plays like a guard. And how ironic that back-to-back, -back, those two guys are dealing with the exact same thing. And you say, will they come back the same? Um, yeah, they will come back the same. I think, I think Stewie will come back the same. She is young enough, and she has the, the body type that can heal pretty quickly. Um, will she be missing anything when she gets back? That is probably going to be more, what am I missing because I'm afraid? Am I afraid to go up and try to dunk it? Am I afraid to go block that shot? Even though she may be ready, her mind might not be ready. But at some point, it's all going to come together again. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited to watch her play. I missed, I missed watching her last year. She just... She just does some incredible things.
He really does. Can I sneak in a question about yesterday? About yeah. You know, Anna and Aubrey seemed like they built off what they did against Tennessee. Do you feel that way? As yeah. Well? I feel like those two are really are really starting to feel I'm a part of this team. I can impact the team other than in 40-point blowouts. I can impact the game while the game is being played when it's still undecided. And th their comfort level is such that um, they're only going to get better and better and better. Um, and, and to be honest, I thought the minutes that Ev gave us were really, really impressive because um, you know, she hasn't had a chance to play much. And she did a lot of really good things. So, yeah, I mean, look, Anna's an experienced player. She's played a lot of basketball. I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised that she's starting to find herself, you know? And Aubrey's got special gifts. She does. That's all there is to it. She's just got special gifts, and uh, she's learning how to use them. And that makes us a different team. We're a much different team when, when Anna and, and, and uh, Aubrey are playing at the top of their game. How different is it coaching a young post player like Liv as opposed to what was like 20 years ago with the first player, or even 10 years ago? It feels like now more versatility is almost demanded. Yeah. And yeah. I she's a different body. Yeah. She, uh, I was talking to Rebecca about this the other day before the Tennessee game. Liv does remind me a lot of Rebecca. Um, in, in that when Rebecca was here her first two years, I remember every day I would say to her, how come we stink now that you're here? <laughs> like, we used to be really good. <laughs> well, it just so happened that, like, there were some really good teams in the Big East at the time. And, um, and Rebecca wanted to play like a big guard. So she wanted to set a screen, shoot a three, you know, go down on defense, block a shot, you know. Like you watch her, pictures of her posted up, she's like, like this. Like, so I remember having to say to her, that's one of the things I said to Maya as the game has changed. And Rebecca was maybe at the forefront of that. You will not be allowed to shoot any threes until you learn how to play in the lane. This is how we're going to build your game. Inside out, not outside in. The world maybe has changed today. Nobody wants to play inside anymore. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to play in the lane. So you get somebody like Liv who's 6'5", you know, and long, and you go, why do you not want to play in the lane? Other than the fact that it's physical in there and you're going to get beat up, why do you not want to play in the lane? I mean, I don't, I don't think you made one jump shot against Oklahoma, maybe two, and you had 27 points. See how easy it is? So you can shoot all the threes you want. Once I know that when we need a bucket, we just throw it to you in there and you get a layup. But right now, we don't have that. So what? That's going to be the, the, the default button. Uh, let's just let them shoot threes. That's not the way you become a really good player. And that might be good for our team. Maybe that's good for our team, you know, because we need points to win. I don't think that helps live one, I, one iota in becoming a better basketball player. So it's it's a challenge coaching big kids today. That's why sometimes you know I like when they can't they can't shoot. I mean I I, I, don't, I don't mean like they can't shoot, but like somebody like Stephanie became a great three point shooter after she learned to dominate inside. And you look at her now and like there's nothing she can't do on a basketball court. So. Yeah, lives a challenge. She's a real, real challenge. A real challenge. But, you know, coaching in general is a challenge these days. When you, uh, you know, you're talking about the influence on the national team of this group, but also if you look at this group, how many different ways this coach are impacting basketball right now? Asia is a WNBA coach. Swin is in an NBA front office. Rebecca and Sue both have big presences in the media. You have other, um, you know, elements of basketball. What does that mean to you? Because like that influence is going way beyond even women's college basketball. Yeah, the 
the thing that I, I've always taken away is when you come here to play, basketball is just a part of what you have to get good at. Because every day you're confronted with you guys. The expectation level is through the roof. The, the scrutiny is through the roof. The media attention is greater than any other place. So you learn how to deal with all the things that go with what's happening on the court. What's happening on the court is, is, is one thing. All the other stuff, when you add it all up, when you leave here, you, you have to say to yourself, I really love this. I really love all this. I love the game. I love being a part of it. I want to stay a part of it. I want to play as long as I can, and then I want to be involved in the game as long as I can. And when you have kids that become comfortable around you guys, then they become comfortable in any scenario. There's nothing that anybody can do to them that would go, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm not ready for this. So I, I feel like they leave and they're prepared for, you know, um, about just about anything that could happen. And then the other thing is, in order to win as much as we have and in order to be what we've been, you have to recruit basketball players. And I think sometimes what's happening today is there's just kids who play basketball, but they're not real basketball players. We talk about this in golf. So there's guys who play golf and then there's golfers that live the game, read the game, talk about the game, watch the game, read the game. And same thing with basketball. All those guys you talked about, if they weren't playing the game, they were watching the game or they were talking about the game. So the game was the biggest part of their lives. And I, I don't know if that's the case today. I'm not saying it's not. I just don't know whether it is or not.